So continuing on middle adulthood now, um, we're now going into more of the social and emotional changes, which quite frankly are very difficult. It was difficult for me to not talk about some of these earlier on because this is where Erickson, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Erickson has his most um, most fascinating uh, discovery with his stages. And that is the difference between generativity and stagnation. Um, now, the rest of the changes you can kind of see coming, but I really like generativity versus stagnation, if for no other reason, because uh, if the word generativity, I think it's, it's a great word, it's a great description of a word, uh, the idea of generativity is that you want to give to the next generation. And this can be a desire to, uh, to be immortal, to live on past your own life. Uh, so, you know, maybe you want to teach children. Maybe you want to have children. So a part of you lives past into the next generation. Maybe you want to make great works of art. Maybe you want to, uh, to you know, teach your grandchildren or be a teacher. Uh, and we'll talk about a lot of these different things with gen generativity later on. And at about this stage, you're no longer trying to... Uh, increase your mastery over something. I mean, by all means, you might continue to become a master in something, uh, but at this point, you've kind of you kind of found your life path, for lack of a better description. You know the general direction that you want to go in life, and by all means, you, you can change that, but I'm talking about general human nature here. Um, and uh, so at this point, now that you've kind of found the path to be on, that whole what do I want to be when I grow up it is gone. So now you're helping other people go through the what they're going to be when they grow up and trying to kind of point them in the right path. This, by the way, is the other reason why that free range children thing is uh, is kind of a crock and kind of a bad idea, because a lot of it is essentially parents not doing their jobs. Their job as a parent is to kind of be past that whole make your own choices thing. And your job is to, to be prepared as an adult to help point people in the right direction, to give them wisdom, to tell them the errors of your ways so they don't have to make the same errors themselves. Um, to have this sense of generativity. Not to just, you know, throw them off in a field and say, hey, choose whatever career you want to. I'm sure they're all good. And then lie to them and tell them they can do anything they want to. Um, now, of course, the other option is stagnation. Uh, and, of course, they don't talk about that at all in the book because that's negative and we don't like that. But let's talk about it. What happens to, to somebody in their, you know, their 40s, 50s, 60s even that... Um, that don't give to anybody else, that their life is just kind of enclosed within themselves. You know, maybe somebody that doesn't have any children, maybe somebody that doesn't particularly have a career with lasting effects. I mean, there's a lot of careers that don't have lasting effects. I mean, you can be a banker, you can be a, you know, a lawyer, you, you can do all these things. Um, you know, what about a, a 50 year old woman who's, who's still, you know, working a dead end job as a waitress or something? She doesn't have any children. Uh, she's just partied her whole life. You know, she kind of had that young attitude of woo. Um, and, and she was just kind of living for the moment. What's she going to do at this point? Uh, well, the idea, as far as Erickson goes, is that she's going to stagnate. Her life is going to become less meaningful for the rest of her life. And this will chase her till the day she dies because she will always live with this sense that, that she just hasn't done anything worthwhile. And she never will. You know, her life is basically useless and she could have never been born and the world would have basically been the same. Um, and this is, that's why this is such a big controversy because it's not just something that affects your life, but it'll, it'll affect the despair and even how you look at all the previous sections of your life. Uh, and the other, the other uh, dialectic controversies that Erickson went through weren't really this critical. Um, now, in the book, they go over a lot of alternative ways to generativity. Um, <clears throat> you know, things that are, are not just raising children. Uh, you know, you can give to the next generation by volunteering. Uh, you can give to the next generation by, um, <clears throat> you know, trying to organize or give to charities. But you really need to keep in mind, these are secondary. 
we are biologically predisposed through evolutionary means, <coughs> excuse me, to want to have children. And during this point in your life, you're supposed to be raising children, not just raising children. You're on the butt end of raising children. Your children are now um, are now adults or they're, uh, they're at least in their teens or in their adolescence themselves. So you really need to start steering towards giving to these next generations. And uh, um, in a lot of viewpoints, things like volunteering and giving to charities and whatnot are almost secondary desperate cries to try to use generativity. Um, I'm not saying they're not worthwhile but they're not as fulfilling to this particular emotional need as the simple act of having children is going to be. Um, but they talk about it a lot in the book, I th in all books. This is not the only one. They always do that. I think to try to make people feel less bad about themselves if they didn't have children, um, because a lot of college professors don't have children and we're the ones that write the book. <clears throat> um, but by all means, these things are secondary. Um, some people actually reach this point of generativity very early on in their lives. You can see for some people, it shapes their entire lives. They'll choose careers based around a sense, uh, around a sense of generativity. I mean, you can't tell me that basically anybody that chooses a career as a kindergarten teacher isn't doing it because they're trying to give to the next generation. That's about the only reason for it. Kids are nuts. Have you ever met one of these little psychos? There, there's no reason to want to be, say, a kindergarten teacher, a first grade teacher, a second grade teacher, unless you really want to. You have this deep emotional need of generativity, of wanting to give to the next generation. Um, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's, it's a very mature attitude to take. And I'm sure these people will face a lot less personal crisis once they reach middle adulthood and will feel a, a much deeper sense of peace and satisfaction than those that did not. Um, there are other careers, by the way, that, um, depending on your motivation, can lead to a deep sense of generativity. Uh, obviously, a teacher is one of these things that just really lends itself to generativity. Uh, but you can be a scientist, and you can have many different motivations for doing this. You can be a scientist with the, uh, the attitude of, you know, um, I want to make the world a better place, just as an example uh, I was speaking to somebody who was in a, uh, a program to be a, a physician, a medical doctor, and uh, they were speaking of it with a motivation of generativity, uh, which was interesting because this person claimed to have no generativity at all. I don't want kids. I don't want this. I don't want that. Uh, I want to be an independent person. But at the same time, when I asked them, you know, why do you want to be a physician? She said, you know, um, I, I actually want to be able to help people. I want to be able to make people's lives better. And when they leave the office, they are better for having met me. You know, I will, you know, and this is all generativity, right? This is, this is going past just yourself and your own life into the next generation. Um, and, and my response was also a response of generativity. I'm like, you know, I can see that, but, you know, this is why I'm a scientist. Because you can help, per, help people one person at a time. Someone will come into your office and... Uh, you know, they'll, they'll say they'll have a cold or, you know, they'll have injured themselves and you can help them. Uh, but meanwhile, I can do some studies and I can increase human knowledge for every, for everybody. The increase may be smaller, but it will be spread throughout such a large group of individuals. I mean, if I can, for example, figure out exactly what psychological needs people have for playing violent video games and then we can um, figure out how the video games can uh, address these needs then we can actually make video games that address psychological needs and make people better people um, so that they have less needs and they can concentrate on bigger and better things in your life everybody's life will be better because of, of my science and that is a that is a, a, a generative um, answer to why I have chosen my career. And a lot of people do that. I mean, even the banker can look at, you know, being a banker as, you know, I'm just doing this, I'm doing that. Or they can look at it as, you know, they're giving people loans, helping them buy houses to raise their children with, touching lives. It really depends on how you look at it, uh, what their personal motivation is. One of the things I want you to know in the book, I'm not going to go over it here, is both Levinson and Valiant's theories. I know I go over Erickson's theories a lot. 
honestly, because they're more written and they're more classic. Uh, but both Levinson and Valiant's theories are very good, but they go over them very well in the book. Um, that's, of course, the other reason I go over Erickson. They don't really go over it that well in the book. They just talk about the good parts and not the bad parts. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the, the things that they, they mention in the book, and they only halfway mention it, um, is during middle adulthood, you kind of change your perspective on things. And uh, one of the things that I want to go over that they definitely don't mention in the book, although they should have, is competitiveness. Now, competitiveness will drive most of our motivations throughout our life um, uh, and how we develop. But there are two types of competitiveness. And a lot of people will say that they're not particularly competitive and that that might be true. I said that for many years myself until I learned the different types of competitiveness. The first one is called goal competitiveness. Now, goal competitiveness is um, where you're competing with yourself. You're trying to be the best person that you can be. And if you, if you study video games like I do, you'll see that a lot of people, this is really what they try to do when they play video games. They try to be the best person they can be. They try to... Uh, to be very successful, to beat their old high scores, to you know maybe do a lot of time trials, you know do the same thing but faster, uh, and this is very important for a lot of people. It gives people a, a sense of accomplishment. This sort of competition. The other one is called interpersonal competitiveness. Now, interpersonal competitiveness isn't trying to be the best person you can be. It's trying to be better than the other guy. Now, um, in my own studies, I have found that. Um, Interpersonal competitiveness is a huge motivating factor for people that like to play violent video games. Um, specifically, people that like to play player versus player things. They like to say, for example, that if you ask anybody that, that plays you know, Halo or, or any of these other games, that it's you against another person, often online. Uh, you know, a lot of PvP World of Warcraft is like this. Anything player versus player. You'll say, you know, why don't you like to just play against the computer? You know, there's... You can play against a computer all day, every day. Why do you gotta, you know, why do you gotta fight another person? And they'll always say, "Well, you know, it's just not hard enough. It's more of a challenge if uh, if I play against another person." And uh, you know, studies have shown that that's crap. It, first of all, it's not more of a challenge because you know, if you're playing World of Warcraft, if you want more of a challenge, you just fight more people. You'll fight higher level people. It's not about a challenge. You can always find a challenge without. Um, without having to target another person. Uh, what these people are actually motivated for by is interpersonal competitiveness. They're not trying to be the best person they can be. They just want to be better than you. That's what really, uh, that's what really gives them a thrill. Um, now, during middle adulthood, interpersonal competitiveness starts to get replaced with goal competitiveness. You're not really worried about the other guy anymore. You're not trying to prove that you're better than someone else. Um, and when, in the book, when they mention the fact that you're worried less about social comparison, uh, this is what they're trying to talk about. They just don't say it all that well. Because you're not comparing yourself socially as much. You're more comparing yourself to yourself. You have more of the goal competitiveness and the and interpersonal competitiveness. Um, Now, uh, in, in about uh, this time, there's the stereotype of midlife crisis, which is huge in this country. Uh, we like to imagine everybody goes through midlife crisis. Statistically speaking, it doesn't happen. It's relatively rare somebody goes through a midlife crisis. By all means, there are changes that people make in their lives during this point in their lives, but no more so than in their 20s. Um, it's almost like this is seen as, uh, as kind of the last chance to change and so we think of it as like a desperate chance to change. But again, think of how many changes a 50-year-old makes compared to a 20-year-old. It's actually less. Um, maybe they make bigger changes, uh, but that just means they're making better decisions. They want to make a change. They're not just doing little tiny useless things. Um, uh, but it's also a misconception that divorces happen a lot more during this time based on this theory of midlife crisis. Um, so much so that we don't understand the statistics. Uh, we've all heard the statistic that half of marriages end in divorce, and that's true. So people think that for every married, for every couple that's getting married, there's a 50% chance they'll end in divorce. Not true. First of all, like I had mentioned previously, statistics don't apply to an individual, so it falls short right there. But another thing is that a lot of people that get divorced get divorced multiple times. Essentially, they have 
for lack of a better description, personality flaws that make them have a hard time with commitment. Maybe they don't, as we mentioned during last time, maybe they don't grow in the same direction as the other person. They, they failed on that um, autonomy versus shame and doubt section of Erickson's when they were very young. And at this point, they, uh, they're so autonomous that they, they're not even choosing the same path as their partner. Uh, maybe they have other problems. Maybe they have a ten maybe they just have a tendency to choose bad partners. You know, maybe they're the person always being divorced. Uh, other people are leaving them because they just have lousy taste in men or women. Um, but the fact of the matter is, a lot of people that get divorced get divorced multiple times, and this really alters this statistic of half of all marriages end in divorce. Because if you take the fact that a lot of divorces are happening to the same people over and over again. Um, then it makes you realize that that first marriage has a pretty high chance of success um, because it's the second and third marriages that are happening to the, to the people who are being divorced over and over again. Most couples in this country still, they get married and they stay together forever, and that's just what they do. Uh, you know, they're going to have problems, but they're going to work through it and they're going to do a good job. Um... Now, uh, Valiant, um, like I said, you need to know both Levinson and Valiant. Valiant talks about old people, um, and, and he starts the talk of old people by the time you're 40, as uh, keepers of tradition. Um, now, that, that is interesting, and that is definitely something that is, uh, that is shown to be true, but uh, it leads to the, both the social and emotional question of why people start to become the keepers of tradition. Um, for example, it's well known that young people have a tendency to be Democrats and older people have a tendency to be Republicans. Republicans, more interested in tradition. Uh, oddly enough, they're worried about innovation, but at the same time, they want, to keep, they want to have innovation to be the biggest and the best and simultaneously keep all the old traditions which keep them from innovating. So there's a lot of conflict there. Um, but if there's a lot of Democrats in the youth and a lot of Republicans when you're older, this basically leads you to the conclusion that Democrats turn into Republicans when they're older. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of statistical truth with this. Um, and a lot of it is honestly based around this keepers of tradition thing. I mentioned this kind of sad, silly nostalgia that we have of, of, of our youth and how things used to be. Um, and a lot of it is based on the fact that we're just not remembering the crap. You know, things sucked when, when, when I was younger. Things sucked when my father was younger. Um, they had stupid fads. I mean, if uh, my father my father was wiser than, than most people. So when I was uh, uh, when I was a kid in the 80s and I had a stupid haircut where we were short on top and long in back and no, I refused to call it a mullet because the word mullet wasn't even invented for another 20 years. Uh, it was just something used later on to make fun of that hairstyle. Um, uh, he couldn't make fun of me because he had a DA when he was a kid. Uh, DA, by the way, was a 50s haircut. It for duck's ass. Uh, it was where they like, feathered it in the back so it looked like the bottom of a duck. Um, uh, you know, But they don't remember that. They just remember the cool things. Um, and that's really the, the sense of this nostalgia and the desire for tradition. Um, but at the same time, tradition makes us unable to adapt. Uh, and it has kind of held back a lot of different countries as far as, as not necessarily quality of life, but as far as the ability to conquer goes, most certainly. I mean, the Native Americans had a lot of tradition, and so they just got stepped on, uh, like, really, really badly. Even the Asian cultures were really steeped in tradition, and yet they had thousands of years of potential advancement over the Western European nations, um, you know, they had gunpowder 2,000 years before Europe had, um, and yet the fact of the matter is Europe could have trampled all over them if they were only closer. They just honestly couldn't afford the frequent flyer miles, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, Europe was just, just had so much more potential, and a lot of it was based on the desire for tradition of the, uh, the Eastern people. Um, and so, really, it's a, it's a way of trying to give to the next generation whatever you happen to have, but keeping that tradition holds you back as an individual um, in a lot of different ways.
being nostalgic about your past is not necessarily a, a positive thing. Um, now, when reading the chapter, what I want you to do, um, one of the last things that I'll talk about today, when reading the chapter, think about all these descriptions of middle adulthood. And then think about why we expect so little of adolescents and young adults, because we really do. We don't expect much of these people at all. It's like they're simpletons that can't do a damn thing right. Uh, I mean, what do we, our expectations of young adults are so few that we're completely accepting of this middle, of this uh, emerging adulthood thing. It's like, yeah, I know they're an adult, but they're not gonna do anything anyway, so why expect that they would? They're gonna be useless for another 20 years. We don't actually expect anybody to accomplish anything until they're 40. You know, that's when, um, it's only approaching this cusp that we actually expect them to, to really even be responsible in any regard. Um, so why do we do that? We expect the males to be very masculine. We expect the females to try to be very feminine. And yet if a, if a 50 year old guy is, you know, trying to show off all the time, we just look down on him. If a, if a 25 year old guy is, is, you know, working out all the time and showing off all the time and trying to be extra butch. Uh, we just go, well, you know, he's young, whatever. He just doesn't know any better. Um, so it's interesting that we have this one time in our life where now we're actually expected to behave like real adults. Uh, when probably we should have behaved like this the whole time. Um, which is, is rather interesting because in the book it mentions, which is very true, that uh, the middle adulthood takes this different perspective because they realize that there are more years behind them than in front of them. Um, let's say, you know, your average life is, is 75. So by the time you hit 40, you're going to, um, you're, you're about in the middle of your life. Um, but essentially that means that the middle adult has less time than the young adult, but more patience. Uh, one of the possible theories on this is that um, by the time you're a middle adult, let's say you're 50, you've done a lot of stupid things. Now, the good things, of course, you're going to remember and you're going to be nostalgic on because humans are stupid that way. But, um, but at the same time, while you're trying to ignore all the stupid things you do, uh, you have done, you still kind of remember them in the perspective and worldview that you're taking. So I, for example, can think back to when I graduated high school and then I, you know, I moved to uh, the city and um, did a bunch of things for about five years before I went back and went to college. And by all means, I had a bunch of jobs. I had, uh, I learned work ethic. I, I would have been useless if I would have went to college right off the bat. I had no desire to be there. Uh, I would have been a lousy student. As it was, I got a bunch of jobs and I was a lousy employee for about three years. Um, but at the same time, I feel that I wasted five years of my life. I mean, I could have had a bachelor's degree. I could have been going halfway through a master's by the time uh, I actually bothered to get around to college to begin with. And, and by all means, I needed those lessons. But, that, but thinking about that just makes me feel inadequate. How inadequate was I that I needed to learn those lessons? I hadn't learned them earlier when I had the time to do it. So um, I'm going to have more patience now because I realize how quick I was to action when I was younger um, and how foolish I was. So I don't want to make those foolish decisions again. I don't want to make those same mistakes. So I'm going to be more prone to being a little bit more patient and be wiser. Um, to this, um, you'll see a lot of females start uh, during this point in life start to get really successful. Uh, it can be difficult for females in this country to reach success before middle adulthood. Uh, and a lot of this is because of the social and emotional changes they're going through. This attitude of, well, I have to work twice as hard as a man to get the same attention goes away. It was crap to begin with, but, um, but it feels right when they're young. It feels valid. So they're basically just showing off all the time. Um, and this starts to go away. They start to get a much more realistic view of life. 
and and they start to get a lot more successful because of it. As a matter of fact, you start to get a lot more androgynous. And if you don't want, don't remember what androgyny is, well, you know that's why I say that these uh, tests are somewhat cumulative. You need to remember what this stuff is when I say it. That's why I say it. Uh, so they start to become a lot more androgynous at this point, um, and uh, uh, and this is going to help them a lot in their careers and in their happiness in their lives. Uh, you know, they kind of less to prove at this point. Um, the last thing that I want to go over, see how much time I have. Uh, okay, so in the, about the next five minutes, that we'll have a good, good half hour uh, lecture here, is um, the big five personality traits. Now, the big five personality traits, uh, they talk about them at this point, but uh, I really think they should have covered them a lot earlier because it's important to look at these different features as you're looking at any point in life. And I've started to go over a little bit, uh, a few of them before when I went over the fact that toddlers have a lot of agreeableness. Now, you can remember the big five personality traits. They go over them in some chart in the book. I can't remember what it is right off the top of my head. Um, but uh, the uh, abbreviation uh, OCEAN. And there's another one, I forget what it is, but OCEAN is always easy for me to remember, O-C-E-A-N. The O stands for openness. Um, now, openness is how open to new ideas you are. Uh, openness is highly correlated with intelligence. It's relatively rare to have somebody who is uh, open to new ideas and therefore not learning a lot. Um, and it's relatively rare to have somebody who's very intelligent and not particularly open to new ideas. Um, uh, and uh, as, as a matter of fact, I, I know somebody uh, recently got to know them in the last year. Highly intelligent, very close to new ideas. And it's weird talking to this individual because the, the two don't really go together that well. But, you know, it happens to, to go together in her case. Um, now, during this point in your life, um, your, your openness really starts to peak a little bit. That sort of intelligence is going to peak at around the age of 53, and then that tradition is going to start to rear its ugly head. So, you know, warn yourself. Try not to let it happen to you. Um, try to continue to be open to new ideas and not stuck in your old ways even after the age of 53. Um, no, the C stands for conscientiousness. Uh, I would spell it out for you, but I can't possibly spell conscientiousness. Uh, just take my word for it. That's what it is. Um, uh, conscientiousness is, uh, excuse me, your attention to detail. And a lot of people look at these things as uh, flaws if you don't have whatever they happen to have. So if you're really open to new ideas, people will say, oh, well, you're just flighty. Or if you're really closed to new ideas, well, you're closed-minded. That's a flaw. No. It's a personality trait. That's it. There's nothing wrong with anybody. And if there's somebody who's not very conscientious, they don't care about attention to detail, you might call them a slob. They're, it's just a personality trait. You might have a very high level of conscientiousness. They might call you a tight ass. You might say you're anal. It's going to make me giggle every time. But, um, uh, but it's just a matter of a personality trait. Uh, some people have a lot of it. I happen to have an extremely low, extremely high level of openness. Uh, as an eccentric, I have a tendency to have a lot of extremes in my in my personalities, um, uh, and an extremely low level of conscientiousness. I am great at starting projects. I am lousy at finishing them. Um, I have welded together 23 bicycles at this point. They've been up to nine feet tall. I rarely bother to put brakes on them. Um, heck, I rode a five foot tall bicycle for about two years, uh, in New England where it's really hilly and I didn't bother to put brakes on it. Um, uh, I think the brakes didn't work that well, so I said, eh, whatever. Um, it's not like you could drag your feet on a five foot tall bicycle. Um, now, so that's conscientiousness, uh, O-C-E. E is extroversion. See, even I have to use the ocean abbreviation. There's no shame in it. It's so easy to remember in this case. Um, especially since there's no order, you have to remember it. And it's not like every good boy deserves fudge or something like that. It's just a word. Uh, so E is extroversion. Um, and a lot of us already know extroversion. Extroversion and introversion. Extroversion is how outgoing you are. Some people are just outgoing. And this is another one that people really consider a personality trait. And they consider a drawback of themselves if they're not highly extroverted. Some people are just shy. 
and for the love of all that's holy, don't be that guy that calls every shy person autistic. It's stupid, and it demeans the fact that there are actually autistic people out there. Being shy does not mean there is something wrong with you. You're just shy, okay? That's, that's fine. Um, uh, you can, by the time you're in middle adulthood, by the way, uh, really learn to deal with the different personality traits more. Maybe you're shy, but that's fine because you've uh, kind of adapted to a life where you know, you've kind of found your niche. Maybe you don't have to work with people a lot. Um, maybe you just work with people who are really close to you, and that works really well. Um, uh, so this is kind of what you do in, in middle adulthood. O-C-E-A. A is agreeableness. Um, why? Because we like you. Um, and so A is agreeableness. Uh, and this is the one that little kids have a lot. And uh, agreeableness is um, going to go down at a lot of your life. And uh, although it's always going to express itself in different ways. So agreeableness at this point is the fact that um, middle-aged people aren't looking for a fight all the time. You know, they can think you're wrong, but they don't feel the need to prove themselves because they're not going to have that interpersonal competitiveness that we just spoke of. So they're not going to constantly try to tell you that, they, that you're wrong. They might not agree with you, and they're fine with that. Um, this is where that awful phrase, let's agree to disagree, uh, thing comes in. By the way, if you want to agree to disagree, fine, do it. But don't tell the other person that they have to agree to disagree too. Now you're just trying to make them agree with something else. It's just a cheap ploy to try to be right again. If you want to agree to disagree, then just do it and shut up about it. Don't try to get the other person to agree with you. Um, so that's, uh, N. Oh, this is the fun one. This is neuroticism. Neurotics are, uh, it's a horribly used word. People think they know what neuroticism is, and they don't. Neuroticism is simply how unstable you are. And, oh, this is a big one that people talk about as being a problem. If you're highly neurotic, oh, there's, there's something wrong with you, right? No, no, no. It's just a personality trait. Uh, some people are very unstable. They're moody. And, and whenever they get in a mood, that mood just owns them. You know, that's all they can remember. Um, you know, by all means, teenagers, much more neurotic than other groups. Like I said, they should have been talking about the big five personality traits the whole time. You know, adolescence, definitely a time for a heavy neuroticism. Um, but again, these are personality traits. They're going to manifest differently during the different ages, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to go away. Um, you know, unless you're going to have a particular age where you're just going to be prone to a particular personality type. Um, uh, neurotics, uh, this is, you know, middle age is a time when neuroticism is going to go away a little bit. You're going to get more stable. You know, you've survived this long. You have a lot of proof that things are going to be okay. Um, uh, so we will continue on this the next time. It's been about 33 minutes now. So... Uh, keep reading the book and keep in mind that thing that I was uh, saying about while you're reading this book, compare everything you're hearing here with how ineffective or the low expectations we have of the other age groups like adolescence and early adulthood and whether or not we should, whether or not we should just have higher expectations like we do with those in middle adulthood.